Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the word that we're about to share wherever we are together today. Let us take meaning from the word and be able to apply it to our lives this week. We ask this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're going to be reading from Hebrews 13, verses 7 through 19. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is not good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought to them into the holy places of the high priests as sacrifice for the sins are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside of the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, and we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledges his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as though who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you to be more earnest to do this in order that I may restore to you the sooner. It is entirely possible to have the facts about a situation right, to know all the details and still completely to misinterpret that situation. You can know the words, you can understand what's going on and still get it all wrong. Years ago, and I shouldn't tell you this, but years ago, uh, my kids, they were really young, they had just learned to read, and they got into, and they could read the little packets of duck sauce at the Chinese restaurant. They got the words right, then they got into a drawn out argument about whether duck sauce was made by ducks, for ducks, or from ducks. They had the words right. That crowd that greeted Jesus as he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, five days before his arrest and trial and crucifixion, that crowd had the basic facts right. They actually understood what was going on. They, they greeted him. You remember they greeted him with cries of Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Israel recognized her king, her Messiah, her savior. And yet, and yet despite that insight, they somehow misunderstood what kind of king Jesus is and how he would come into his kingdom. This is not something that happened after Jesus entry into Jerusalem, like it happened on Monday or Tuesday or something. They had misunderstood this well before. They knew the words, so to speak, from uh, palm branches. You would think, reading your, your Bible, you would think that waving palm branches is a perfectly normal way, a common way to greet a king, but in fact it isn't. You find this nowhere else in scripture. Nowhere else, I should say, in canonical scripture that anyone is greeted with palm branches, but there was a parallel in fairly recent Jewish history and that was when Judas Maccabeus and his army entered Jerusalem after having defeated the armies of the Greek Seleucid Empire. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to see the significance of those palms 150 years later. 
a Jewish hero has risen up once again. And now he's expected to defeat the pagan empire that holds Israel under her heel. History, they hoped, was repeating itself. Even the donkey, even the donkey, they understood the donkey. They got it. They understood that this is a reference to a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that the Messiah would arrive in humble fashion, seated on a donkey colt. Zechariah went on to say that the Messiah would speak peace to the nations and set Israel free by the blood of the Lord's covenant. They knew that reference. The folks lining the streets when Jesus entered Jerusalem knew that prophecy, and they thought they knew how it was going to be fulfilled, or at least how they wanted it to be fulfilled. They were sure that the blood of the covenant that Zechariah spoke of was Gentile blood, the blood of the occupiers, which would be spilled in the streets like the blood of the Egyptians had been 1,500 years before. As Jesus passed, they shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. Now, of course, they had it all wrong. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy, but not in the way most people hoped. The peace that he brought was peace with God. And not only for the people in, in Jerusalem there, not only for, for Jews in general, but, but for sinners everywhere. And the blood of the covenant was Jesus' own, shed on the cross as the atoning sacrifice for sin. They had the facts straight. They recognized Jesus for who he was and completely, utterly misunderstood what he had come to do. They saw, and yet they were utterly blind. Now, that's not really all that remarkable. It's human nature. Far too many people now, far too many people who are sitting in churches, far too many people who call themselves Christians, misunderstand who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. They assume that he's come into the city, so to speak, to solve their problems when in fact, according to our reading from Hebrews 13 here, beginning in verse 12, he's come into the city in order to call us out of it, to follow him out of it. He doesn't come to protect us from suffering like the rest of the world, to be respectable and dignified and honored and comfortable. He calls us to follow where he leads and suffer what he endures because what he offers is something lasting, something greater, infinitely greater than anything we could imagine. Listen, beginning in verse 12 here, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. That's a little odd phrase there. Let us go to him outside the camp. What, what camp? Well, it's easy to understand how Jesus suffered outside the gate, literally the gate of Jerusalem. But what is outside the camp? This is a reference to the camp of Israel. Now think back to the books of, of Exodus and, and Numbers and Deuteronomy, this vast, vast, moving, ever-moving tent city that was centered around the tabernacle, centered around the tent of meeting, this vast tent city in which Israel lived for 40 years in the wilderness after the Lord delivered them from slavery in Egypt, but before they entered the promised land. Now, there were all sorts of rules, as it turns out, about what could be done inside the camp and what had to be done outside the camp. And they were for good reason, mostly sanitary. One of the things that was done outside the camp was to burn the carcasses of the animals that were sacrificed on the Day of Atonement and whose blood the high priest sprinkled inside the Holy of Holies in the Tent of Meeting. And that blood was, was to atone for the sins of the people. In the same way, Jesus suffered outside the camp, metaphorically speaking, the camp in this case being Jerusalem, 
A mere five days after entering in triumph, he's taken outside the city to the hill of Golgotha in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. And according to Hebrews here, how are we supposed to respond to this king who was taken outside the city, out of the camp? Well, the answer here is by going to him outside the camp and bearing the reproach he endured. To be a Christian isn't to avoid suffering or hardship or reproach or embarrassment. It's to suffer with Jesus. This shouldn't come as a surprise. Jesus told us the same thing, didn't he? Uh, Luke 9, verse 23, he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Being a Christian means following Jesus, and following Jesus necessarily means going outside the camp with him, following him to Calvary. It is worth pointing out that this doesn't necessarily mean martyrdom. In the vast majority of cases, it doesn't. Luke 21, verse 16, Jesus tells his disciples, and by extension, he tells you that some of you they will put to death. Some of you, not all of you, some. But all are called to be willing and ready if necessary. You are called, if you are to be a disciple of Jesus, if you're going to follow him, you must be ready to value him. You must already value him more than you value even your own life. But if going outside the camp for Jesus meant his death, and if it doesn't necessarily mean martyrdom for us, what does it mean? What are we being called out of to go with Jesus? Well, I think it's precisely those things that the crowd in the camp of Jerusalem there on Palm Sunday wanted. Comfort, safety, Worldly power and authority, respectability, all these things. Are we willing to leave the camp with Jesus to set foot outside of those things for his sake? Um, to follow, to risk everything, excuse me, for the sake of the gospel. At a bare minimum, this is a call to missions. At a bare minimum. This is a call to missions and evangelism. And not just missions and evangelism, but mission and evangelism in hard places, even dangerous places. To step outside the camp, to go to Jesus outside the camp, is a call to love and to serve precisely those people who are hardest to love and to serve. It's a call to stand for truth when all the world stands against it. In other words, it's a call actually to follow him where he goes and do what he does, knowing full well that you will bear the reproach that he endured. Now, that may sound a little grim, but there's a reminder here in verse 14 immediately after that. Why? Why would we be willing to do this? It says, for we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We have no lasting city. The comforts and safety and respectability of this world are deeply ephemeral. They do not last, which is ultimately the reason why this world can never be our prize and true home. We seek the city that is to come, not made by hands, in which death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore the city in which there is no need for lamplight or sunshine because the Lord God will be its light and those who live there will reign under their true high king forever and ever. It is very easy to misunderstand who Jesus is, even when you have all the facts 
And to mis- deep, it's very easy to misunderstand what Jesus is calling you to do and what he is promising you. Again, even when you know all the words. Here in Hebrews 13, it's not so much that we sit and wait for Jesus to come into the city. We are called to go out of the camp to him and endure the reproach that he endures because what he promises us is infinitely greater than anything we could begin to lose in the process. Praise our King. Amen.